Uh, I live in Serbia, but I'm Lebanese, but I grew up in the U.S. <laughs> and uh, Limino. Okay. Well, if I mess it up, it <laughs> Are we on? We are on. <laughs> Uh, Tatian, oh, there we are. Never mind. <laughs> Shall we start? Mm, yeah, I believe so. So, Hello everyone and welcome to this main session where all the Dynamic Coalition are coming together to share their work with you, to share their achievements and to answer our questions. <laughs> we have 14 speakers here. It's a lot. And we have time constraints. But be sure that we will be able to include everyone who is sitting here and who wants to ask the question. So how this session is going to run? We split dynamic coalitions into small blocks, depending on which field they're working in, which sustainable development goals. I hope you will forgive me if I call them SDGs uh, to save us more time. Which SDGs they pursue. And in addition to question about their work, we have three main policy questions. The first one, overarching one, is how policies that promote internet connectivities and internet use can be designed to be more inclusive, more bottom-up, to provide more participation and to ensure the input from local communities. The second question is related to development of the new technologies such as IoT. How can we secure them, both on the end level, um, on, on the end user level, but also in terms of complex technical measures in cybersecurity? And the last one, with all these intelligent technologies developing, how do we ensure that regulation, legislation, and policies will be human rights centric, will promote and ensure human rights? And I'm going without any due delay to move to the first block of dynamic coalitions that we have that works on various sustainable development goals, but they all have something in common. They promote connectivity and they promote inclusion. And of course, it is related to more overarching aim of such SDGs as good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, decent work and economic growth, to name but a few. And first, DC, I want to ask, to answer our question about their work, is Dynamic Coalition on Connecting the Unconnected. And I would like to ask the speaker, Christopher Yu, about their work. I know that you have been working on, the, on, on, on connectivity, and it is not the first Dynamic Coalition session I moderate. And honestly, I admire work year after year. I know that it is very important in connecting the unconnected and achieving such SDGs as uh, reducing inequality, de decent work and economic growth, as I said, to name a few. What have been done this year to connect who are still remain unconnected? And what are your challenges in connecting them? Well, thank you very much, Tatiana, for such a kind introduction. Uh, what we are doing is collecting data. When we talk to policymakers about precisely the issues that you raise, they're constantly asking for more solid information. And they need it not just to figure out whether the, to commit resources to promoting connecting the unconnected. Actually, that's not really the problem. There's a consensus now that that needs to happen. They need to know where to invest and how much to invest and to mobilize the international finance community. They need to know what's the impact of a marginal investment of additional money. And you find that it's not just, uh, we need to carry it not just for connectivity for its own sake, 
but for its contributions to the Sustainable Development Goals. And really what our work has done is to change the focus beyond just connectivity to start to measure what does the connectivity get you. And so I'll talk about a couple different things. So first, we have a database of 1,000 interventions of people around the world, and we've contacted them all and now generated 120 case studies that allow us to do collect data in ways that permit cross-project comparisons most don't collect any data, and they usually do it in a very, those few that do collect data collect it in an idiosyncratic manner that doesn't permit comparisons. And what we discover is without data, people fall in love with the technology and think that it's the solution to everything. And what we discover, that what the data tells us is that different solutions, even within a single country, different parts of it, the urban and the rural regions, uh, the more mountainous regions, the less educated regions, will all require different types of interventions. And they will all require interventions on both the demand side and the supply side. We've all learned the hard way, the idea that if you build it, they will come, is simply not true. They need digital literacy training. There's a number of gender obstacles that need to be overcome and they need programming and lessons about how to do that and what will work and will not work as well. Uh, what's really interesting, just to give you a couple of headlines of what we learned, many people are really worried about uh, capital expenditures. Actually, as it turns out, uh, operating expenditures are more critical because if you lose money on every successive year, it doesn't matter if your initial build was expensive or, or, or cheap. Um, and then most of those operating expenses are in backhaul. Uh, as I mentioned, we need to do demand side uh, interventions, but in fact, the digital literacy training, people understand it's necessary, but people don't really know what it means. Is it basic skills training? Is it more advanced training? Is it just initial training or more sustaining engagement after that training and building of mentorship and communities? And we're in the process of studying those different implementations in a concrete way. Uh, we discovered that uh, the majority of projects have no revenue. They receive grant or government funding or corporate social responsibility funding, but have no ability to evolving into being self-sustaining. For some of the government projects, they are designed to continue to get ongoing funding, but for most of the grant and corporate social responsibility funding, they are not. And so uh, we've been encouraging people who make these grants to, to validate business models that have the ability to become self-sustaining. And then lastly, we've, this point I made, we are doing active studies to look at the impact of connectivity on healthcare, on education, on development, economic development, as Tatiana mentioned, using the gold standard of research, which is uh, randomized controlled trials and controlled trials to really get an assessment. We thought we would be contributing to a literature that already exists. We found out in researching it that there's never been a paper really solidly substantiating this. So uh, we really uh, encourage you to, if you're interested, we have a website at oneworldconnected.org and we would encourage anyone interested to join our dynamic coalition or just to contact us directly. We'd be happy to share what we've learned with you in greater depth. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you for sticking with time. I just realized that I so much wanted to start this session that I didn't introduce myself and my co-moderator. So I'm Tatiana Trepina from Leiden University, and my co-moderator... My name is Michael Ogia. I'm from the Global Forum for Media Development. And I'm actually going to jump in here now because obviously the things you're doing at the DC um, Connected, Chris, is really important. What's also important to consider is once we get people connected, how then do we engage them and make sure that they can continue to take advantage of, of the opportunities that the internet and ICTs offer. And so um, we're actually gonna jump now to Gunila. So I wanna uh, come to you because um, for many years, your, your DC has really been critical at trying to make, you know, really bridge this gap between those who have accessibility and disability needs and kind of where our technology currently is. Um, accessible especially, and people, for people with disabilities. It really, uh, it serves uh, SDG 10 about reducing inequalities quite well. And so um, I see from your, you know, from your submission, from the work that you've been doing from this year, that uh, your focus um, has been on the participation of people with disabilities um, in, in internet governance. And so basically we want to know what are the ways, uh, what are some of your ways of catalyzing such involvement of those individuals with disabilities, or those with accessibility needs? What has been done so far, over the, especially over the past year? And how do we exactly make internet governance processes more accessible and more inclusive? Thank you very much. 
Yes, and it's good to follow on from Christopher because uh, uh, connecting the unconnected um, is very important for people with disabilities, certainly in the global south, where uh, there is limited possibilities at this stage for people with disabilities. And we know that there are w well over one billion people globally with disability. So we're talking about a very large number of people. And certainly in, in the global south, uh, it might be 85% 80, of that one billion. Um, so we, we have focused um, in the past, and we will continue to do so, to encourage persons with disability to engage in the internet governance processes. And, and one of the sayings in the disability is, in movement is nothing about us without us. So the voice of people with disability needs to be heard in fora like, like this. And the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability has been operating as one of the first dynamic coalitions within the IGEF. And uh, one, uh, one of the uh, ways we operate uh, uh, is to assess how accessible the IGF venue is and also the online facilities. And we had a meeting today um, discussing just that. And while we appreciated very much the accessibility in a number of ways of, of this venue, and certainly the volunteers um, from the German hosts have been really fantastic to help the, the persons with disability who need to get around the venue. And, and so from that, uh, we are then able to discuss together uh, with the support uh, of, uh, in this case, the IGFSA to uh, enable um, some of us to travel to be here today and during this week of IGF. And accessibility for peace, people with disability is really a cross-cutting issue. We, we really uh, feel we can liaise uh, quite well with just about all the DCs sitting here um, because, well, obviously we're connecting the unconnected, the Internet of Things, which we're going to talk about later, um, gender issues, and so it goes on. Um, there are uh, issues from the perspective of persons with disability in all of these areas. And certainly, as you state, um, the SDG goal that's really important um, for our DC is to reduce inequalities within and among countries in particular. There's, a goal, there's target 10.2, which discusses the um, empowerment and promotion of a social, economic and political inclusion of all, irrespective of age, sex, disability, race, ethnicity, origin, religion or economic or other status. And we, um, we also refer to uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which has been signed by over 180 people, um, which um, uh, requires a number of governments to abide by the particular articles in that convention. And I can talk a bit more about that later. So thank you very much. Tatiana? Thank you very much, and again, thank you very much for keeping the time. My pleasure, sorry. I just realized I'm, I'm staying in this block for just a little bit longer. So let's go, let's, let's continue the track basically with inclusion, because that's really, I think, a lot of what this first block is focusing on. And in fact, um, well, uh, I don't believe, do we have anybody here from the, um, do, is Stuart here? I don't see, oh, you. <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, I he just... arrived a bit late. Right here. What? He arrived a bit late, I believe. So. Fair enough. Well, Stu, it's good to see you. Um, so, obviously, um, Stu, is, is, you're working with um, public access and libraries, uh, the DC of public access and libraries, and libraries have become such a, a key way of providing connectivity, especially in, in places where connections are not as good or in places where digital literacy is a lot lower. And so, um, a big part of it, one of the big SDGs that your uh, DC connects to is uh, SDG 17, which is uh, focusing on the partnerships for the goal and helping, and in this case, uh, with your DC, helping people access the internet 
and, um, like I said, focus on public libraries and public institutions of sorts. In your experience, what are the most important components of a policy that will support libraries as public internet access points, and what is currently being done by your DC to influence the adoption of such policies? Thank you, Michael, and sorry for being a little bit late. We had a dynamic coalition meeting, so uh, we've come straight from that. Um, and actually, in that meeting, we discussed the first part of the question, which is, um, you know, what sort of policy environments do we need to be successful at our, our jobs? And I think it's worth reminding ourselves that we have over 400,000 public libraries worldwide, which is, I think, makes us one of the most interesting stakeholders in IGF, because that's, that's 400,000 physical internet access points all over the world, and I can only think of maybe post offices as another similar stakeholder, but, but we're, we're, we're pretty unique in that regard. What we're looking for are policy frameworks that are going to get our libraries connected where they're not connected and connected better where they are. We want high-speed access where we can possibly get it, and to do that, we want to make sure that our libraries are included in national broadband plans, where a national broadband plan is, is a part of a national development plan, we want to be included in those, and we want to be included in any sort of specific development plans around the SDGs. So our session that we just had focused a little bit on the extent to which we already are, and we've commissioned a piece of research through the DC uh, which analysed 32 plans where we found libraries included as public access points. So that's encouraging, but there's a long way to go to get more than 32 countries in that regard. Uh, but we're very encouraged by the recent report from the Broadband Commission, which actually specifically recommends public access as a, as a mechanism to increase connectivity. Now, when it comes to the specific actions of the DC that we've been up to, um, we have been quite productive. Uh, we developed principles on public access, which is a framework to catalyze discussion for everybody here within the IGF around um, moving towards universal access through public access. We contributed to the intercessional IGF work on policy options for connecting and enabling the next billion and included case studies in that, which we think is very important to connect the policy and show you exactly how it's done on the ground. Um, we developed a public access policy toolkit, which outlines the key policy elements that I've just talked about and the steps that we need to take to create this enabling environment, uh, which we really think is a great place to start for understanding what it is that we need. Um, several members of our dynamic coalition have also been engaged in something called the Partnership for Public Access, or P4PA, um, and there we've gone a little bit further and we actually have a project in Tunisia that we've been working on, focused on digital literacy and coding, and we've also been engaging with the Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation. There are many more other little bits and pieces we're doing, but I think these are the high-level things I want to bring out here. Thank you. Wow, and stayed well over time. So. Wow. Yeah, so thank you so much for that, Stuart. And so, Tatiana, I'm going to hand the floor back over to you. Uh, and with this, I would like to make a short break if there are any questions we have here or any questions from the remote participants. If no, then we will continue with the same, uh, unless you have any questions to your fellow Dynamic Coalition panelists yeah. about your work or collaboration or cooperation. If not, then we will move to the Dynamic Coalition um, on Community Connectivity. And I know that Jane Coffin was going to be there. Yeah. So I, I can quickly introduce you. This is Carlos Rey Moreno. And so thank you so much for joining us, Carlos, and for being part of this. Uh, so Thank you very much. Yes, it, it got me a bit confused because I didn't see Jane in the room. Um, uh, your DC, uh, with your work, comes closely to what we talked about, about connectivity and inclusion. But I know that you are working on achieving SDG in a bit of a different way because you are focused on the local communities on this truly bottom-up approach uh, to connect via community shared network, via alternative um, means. So I would like to ask you in general, how do you think, how does it contribute to uh, achievement of sustainable development goals? How does it contribute to bottom-up approach to inclusion? And how is your work complementing to work of those dynamic coalitions and other groups? who are working on connectivity as well. Thank you. 
thank you very much. Uh, I'm obviously not Jane Coffin. Uh, I, I was asked to, to replace her very last minute. Um, my name is Carlos Rey Moreno. I work for the Association for Progressive Communications and I've been engaging with the Dynamic Coalition on Community Connectivity since their second year, 2016, in Guadalajara. Uh, every, every year ever since, uh, there has been a publication coming out of the, of the Dynamic Coalition uh, where uh, different members of the coalitions have been providing their, their input and, uh, and a, 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 a publication that has been, become many, very meaningful to articulate uh, some of the ideas and the bottom-up approaches that you were mentioning from, from all over the world. Um, also, uh, well, this year, and I also arrived late uh, as a steward because uh, our session just finished, literally, and uh, maybe a request uh, provided the significant uh, synergies in between the Dynamic Coalition on Public Access and Libraries and the Dynamic Coalition on Community Connectivity, including the Partnership for um, P4PA, Public Access, the Partnership for Public Access, which considers community networks as one of their three pillars, it would be pleased to the MAG not to put them at the same time. Because then it's very difficult to build synergies in between the two uh, dynamic coalitions as we have done in the previous years. Um, in relation to, to, to that and in relation to the, to, the, to the SDGs, going back to the, to the, to the question that you asked me, and maybe also on, on the collaboration that in many years, but in particular this year, we have had with the Dynamic Coalition on innova innovative approaches to, to connecting the unconnected. There was something that Professor Yu said on, on, the, on, the, on his Dynamic Coalition around community connectivity that was, many people thought that it was not possible. And after several years, you've proved that community connectivity is just another alternative to connect the unconnected. And, um, and here it is where I want to link with the SDGs. If you think about the SDG 9, uh, well, 9C in this case, the target 9C, which talks about um, universal affordable access uh, for everyone, especially in the least developed countries, um, and the way it's been measured, that is uh, uh, connectivity or people connected to mobile by technology, that is 2G, 3G, 4G. If you look at the statistics, uh, on a, or if you look in a year-to-year -year growth, everything is grow going up, right? Every year there is more people connected, which is great. Every year there is more people connected per technology, which is great. But the rate at which that growth is taking place is plateauing, is plateauing very badly. Uh, even the ITU recognized it uh, last month. So alternatives are necessary. Public libraries are necessary. Other innovative approaches are necessary. Community networks are necessary. Because the, the, the model that, that we had up to now, and uh, the, IT, uh, the ITUD director, Ms. Doreen uh, Bogdan Martin, in the opening of the uh, introduction on digital inclusion, said that we need new models, that we need new regulation and policy frameworks, and that's particular where, particularly we, where we have been, the publication of this year is particularly on those policy and regulatory frameworks that are necessary and the changes within them to accommodate these innovative approaches like community networks in the policy and regulatory frameworks of the different countries. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. And as we saved five minutes for the questions, before we move to the next dynamic coalition, I do want to ask you a question, a question that in my mind connects several of you. I've heard the words regulation, I've heard the words policy frameworks, I've heard the word investments, and it strikes me like how much does your work on connectivity depends on investments, on enthusiasm, on existing tools? Does it strictly depend on funding? Because it does strike me that a lot of this depends on effort of people and on existing tools that you are just advancing, empowering people. So can anyone comment on this? I think that this is a very interesting issue. How much does it depend on money and on existing tools? Or do you really need also to invest a lot in development of technology? 
So from our perspective, it's a mix of almost all of them. So what's fascinating in a session I participated in earlier, um, so, uh, Telefonica is uh, cooperating with uh, Facebook and it's an extraordinary joint venture with the support of the Peruvian government in reducing some regulatory barriers to find out that uh, they get better information that they can use to serve areas with conventional business models that they didn't previously know were actually potentially servable. So that's one solution within the traditional mode. There's community networks which have filled a gap where frankly many of the traditional network models will not work. Mm. And many of them are completely self-sustainable, in which case it's studying what they have an education system of what works, what doesn't, uh, how to build senses of communities to build the real framework and to, to get more learning that way. And then we find out those areas which cannot exist under conventional models and need mm -hmm. public support or some other support. But understanding also where the, each of those lies mm -hmm. becomes absolutely helpful to extend the limited money that we have. So to me, it's not really an either or question. It's a question of we're gonna to need to do many things and there's stuff where we're gonna invent new technologies for as well. And we have to be openly experimental. And you talk about the policy side, we've talked a lot about uh, broadening what the sometimes called regulatory sandboxes, changing more flexible regulation where people can experiment, whether it's in uh, legacy regulation that's applied or spectrum policy, but to try new things because that's how we learn. Thank you very much, Stuart. So, so with us, I mean, a lot of our work does really depend on, on sort of regular funding, but then often public libraries are part of existing um, government machinery, uh, and there's advantages and disadvantages to that. When it's a good time for public funding, that's great. When it's not so good, in some countries, my own, the UK included, it can have very negative repercussions. Um, but the goal that we were uh, asked to talk about, actually, Goal 17, is an area where I think we really leverage in the library community partnerships quite well. We're, we're quite promiscuous, as it were, and we'll partner with anyone that wants to get with us. Um, and that can actually lead to some of the sustainability that, that is needed to take the infrastructure projects or the connectivity projects a little bit further forward. So libraries are actually naturally quite good at partnering. Uh, and we find ourselves falling back on that. In the, in the DC session that we just had, we had case studies from the use of universal service funds in Uganda and Kenya. So we're very keen on seeing more of that. But when they run out, you need that sustainability. So partners, we've had Microsoft come in in those cases, private sector, and also some foundations. So we really look to attract that. So like Christopher said, it's, it's a mixture of both that we need. Thank you very much. And I mean, they have elaborated significantly in, uh, around funding. I think for the next step forward into connecting the unconnected through at least community connectivity, I, people may not agree with me. I don't think funding is a problem. I think there is enough people willing to, there is enough mechanisms to, to make money available to this type of, of, of projects. The people is there. The people are ready. The people are requesting to, to, to be able to set up uh, this type of infrastructures by themselves, the main limitation is their regulatory framework, and in particular, the spectrum. The way that the spectrum has been allocated and up to now has worked for connecting people in wealthy urban areas, but not in remote, lower income, sparse population. Actually, there is quite significant evidence that all operators combined are not using their spectrum in many of these areas of the countries, in Africa in particular. So making that spectrum available in, in well, we had the, a person from Ofcom who has uh, recently released a secondary use of spectrum um, regulation, which is in all the IMT bands, could be something that, that many, many other regulators could apply and could make much easier uh, for these communities, which are already ready, which, where, where the technology is ready, where the funding is ready to deploy this type of, of initiatives and contribute to SDG 9C. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the last intervention before we move to another dynamic coalition. <laughs> Yes, from a perspective of accessibility and disability, um, we like to work with everyone. And, and so when it comes to uh, the frameworks, uh, we, we enjoy the um, 
importance of legislation and regulation um, to, to help us bring the message of accessibility um, within the private sector so that the private sector understands, yes, sure, there, there are some sticks, but there's also a number of carrots to ensure that uh, products and services are being made available. For example, um, there's um, public procurement uh, that incorporates accessibility criteria. Uh, that's in uh, the US, European uh, Commission countries and also in Australia. And, and that will spread to a number of other areas as well. So uh, it, there's a benefit to um, uh, developing accessible products to be able to supply governments. But it's also from a perspective of um, ensuring that there, there are accessible products there when, when you're meeting um, a customer base that potentially is very large. And, and so uh, it's awareness racing, it's, it's uh, sometimes overcoming attitudinal barriers uh, to understanding um, the need for accessibility, but also the, the potential um, for, for everyone to, um, to make sure that products and services are accessible. Thank you so much. And we are moving to the next dynamic coalition which approaches connectivity and inclusivity from a bit of a different angle. And it is a youth coalition on the internet governance. And I want to ask you, why is the youth engagement important for, the, for pursuing of the 2030 sustainable development agenda? What does youth inclusion look like to you? And what would be your indicators of success? Yes, yeah. Oh, sorry. And uh, the speaker is uh, Virginia Balchunaita. <laughs> Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, so to commence my intervention, my short intervention, I want to start off with a super short story. And it will bring you all to Pakistan. It brings you to a story of a young activist, an activist who works and tries to save the world by educating girls and empowering widows. And it's a, it's a, it's a funny, it's, a, it's not a sad story, spoiler alert. Uh, why I'm telling you the story, because Weisig has worked a lot to help him in the application process, and help him in the visa process. So you can imagine how happy we were when the visa was accepted, and when he finally got here to Berlin. And he finally is here, activating, uh, advocating for young voice, for Pakistani young voice, and addressing young people here, addressing stakeholders here. And also, we managed to connect him with different stakeholders who potentially could help him out in the future, who gave uh, valuable advice for his work. And this story shows the activities of Weisig because it represents the four key activities that I also want to, to talk about. So basically, it's the outreach, the leadership, uh, the representation of youth, and partnership. So first of all, the outreach. We, we start off by um, giving the young, the young people information about what is happening, by advocating about IGF, about internet governance, about other regional events that are happening here and around young people, but simply they are not aware of them. And um, it usually happens in formal and informal settings. We have a big mailing list where people are also talking to each other, and we also engage in peer-to-peer -peer learning and peer-to-peer -peer education. When, for example, a lost young person comes to I I Internet Governance Forum, and he or she doesn't understand what's happening, and then we engage with, with telling them what's happening, where to engage, with whom to talk. And then leadership building is also includes a lot of trainings, in, mostly informal trainings, uh, talking and giving them access to, to different stakeholders. And then also another important aspect is the representation of young boys, because YSIG uh, provides IGF also with the young people, young voices, and we give the, the youth voice we, 
to these kind of policy forums. We are sitting in the sessions because of WISIG. We represent the Young Voice because of Youth Coalition of Internal Governance. Uh, so it's a valuable experience also to share the ideas and for other young people to share their uh, expertise and insights in these kind of sessions. And finally, the partnership aspect is particularly important because in the, for example, in lunch breaks, we connect young people with stakeholders, for example, with the academia, with the tech industry, with various types of people who are here, but the young people they would not be able to know because they simply don't have a network yet. So YSIG is here to support the young people in all these four main activities that I wanted to share with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before we move to another dynamic coalition, are there any questions or questions from remote participants? Seeing none. Uh, this youth dynamic coalition was a perfect bridge to our next block of dynamic coalitions which work on such issues and as inclusion from perspective of gender equality, from health and well-being, from uh, from the point of uh, view of, of protecting vulnerable targets, vulnerable targets, for example, child safety. But I would like first to start with the dynamic coalition on gender. And speaker uh, Smita Vanyar, I have a question for you. I know that gender equality is one of these big development goals, we are, uh, sustainable development goals we are trying to achieve. In the recent years, there was a growing awareness about harassment and a big movement to undercover it and tackle it. How does your dynamic coalition contribute to um, tackling this problem both online and offline? Thank you. Thank you for the question. <clears throat> um, one thing which we have to firstly recognize is that when we talk about online harassment and particularly gender-based on, uh, uh, violence online, it is never a one-step solution, right? It, it's, uh, it, it's because the violence is never one step. You have violence on different de levels. Sometimes it is the access itself which is not possible without violence. Once you get online, then what happens there, right? Uh, do when we speak about access, is it just uh, is it should we just speak about access or should we be actually talking about meaningful access? Because in India, for example, what happens is that it's not that the women and girls don't have phones, but the fact is that they are surveilled heavily, right? And they may be using a shared phone with their family. Um, any of the activities online, we will be severely monitored. They may not be allowed to put up photos. And anyone who speaks up online, again, faces immense trolling and harassment. Uh, in fact, the trolling itself, the very nature of trolling against people who speak up is very gendered. Because it's different from what men face our male presenting person's face. And um, which is why the, the solutions for this has to be at multiple levels. Uh, one is of course online, on ground work with women and girls themselves and empowering them, building capacities. But it is also important that we don't put the full onus of this on the persons who are attacked, on the persons who are surviving, on the persons who are already facing the violence, right? Because if we do that, then it's not a feminist approach to dealing with online violence and sexual harassment. It is important that we put the onus, we put um, the burden of solving this problem where the responsibility lies, which is, not, uh, which is not just the women and girls, but also internet intermediaries, platforms, governments, because in many places there are no laws to deal with certain kinds of online harassment, right? In many countries, uh, for example, um, non-consensual sharing of images uh, and especially of intimate images are seen as data, data, data protection violations, whereas in actuality it's an assault, it's sexual assault, and it needs to be treated as that. When we don't speak about it, what we're doing is that we're separating um, the violence which happens from the bodies which are facing the violence. And it's very important that we don't do that, and we address violence as a continuum. What happens online does not just stay online, it also moves offline. Right? Um, the reason, uh, the one of some of the things that the Gender Dynamic Coalition does is also bring in gender very actively into the space of the IGF. Because the Internet Governance Forum is not only for discussing issues which are now and current, but also emerging issues. Um, online harassment is one of the topics which um, 
has been going on. The conversation around this has been going on for a while. But it's also important that we evolve this conversation to anticipate what are the future problems that will come, especially with machine learning, especially with artificial intelligence and algorithmic decision making. How are people of different genders affected? And this is another important element here when we speak about gender, right? When we speak about gender, our conversation often remains limited to women. But gender is not just man or woman. And if we don't go beyond the binary when we speak about gender, then it will be too late to address this, um, this, this spectrum which exists. And um, I think when one of the important things that the Dynamic Coalition on Gender and, Int and Internet Governance does is also bring in gender into these supposedly technical panels, which often um, are viewed as neutral and not influenced by gender and other social factors, which is very, very, very far from the truth. And um, I would stop here with this answer, and I, I hope to continue it in the next section. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a powerful message. Yeah, thank you. And, and it's also about how the, l the lack of women online because of, for instance, harassment, and not just other women, but also other marginalized groups, it's like we're trying to build all of these technologies and this inclusive internet, but yet so many people are facing the problem of then not being able to hope to participate because of what's online. So thank you for that. And so aside from gender and diversity issues, one of the most, uh, one of the more um, excluded groups online is easily children because you know, children aren't necessarily involved, uh, in, are obviously usually not involved in the policymaking process. And so I want to move to Marie Lerae and talk a little bit about um, you know, uh, kind of what's going on with, young, uh, with not just young people and youth in general, but specifically uh, on gaming platforms and online gaming in general. And I've long actually thought to myself, you know, gaming is such a huge industry and it relies so much on internet uh, technologies. And yet gaming platforms aren't here. Gaming is not really something we hear about very much. Um, so I really want to just address what are some of the fundamental challenges to your work and how do they reflect challenges to achieving the SDGs, specifically those related to inclusion, um, and, uh, not to, and not to mention good health and well-being, as I'm sure you'll address, the quality of education and obviously partnership for the goals. Thank you. Yes, um, so this year we had a dedicated session to the gaming platforms and so did we last year actually because we felt that um, we had not spent enough time and we needed to develop and, and go deeper this year. On both occasions uh, we tried to um, convene a sort of a balanced panel where we would have different sectors represented including the voices of gamers, young gamers and, and um, I'm pleased to say that I think we reached our objective this year and we also didn't want to focus the topic from our anxiety and our fears because this is where most parents and perhaps as you know uh, citizens we, we sort of react when we talked about those topics and uh, it was very interesting because we sort of mentioned the fact that indeed there is a level of anxiety and there are dangers and there are risks but also there are many opportunities and as a matter of fact this morning um, the Global Kids Online report was launched uh, by Dr. Sonia Livingston and her team and one of the finding, findings and they, they sort of took the methodology European um, developed at European level and took it outside of the European region and applying it in more than 10 countries outside of Europe. And they found that very young children engage with games uh, in the range of eight to 12 years old, and that's actually a way of developing social skills and enhancing their collaborati collaborative skills. And they call it the first step to, um, in the ladder towards uh, youth participation and engagement. So that's the positive side of it. But of course, we also discussed other topics such as companies using, collecting data, uh, profiling children so that they turn them into consumers and get them, perhaps draw them towards gaming and, and gambling platforms, which that would be the, the harmful bit and the risky uh, part of it. Uh, we also discussed the fact that um, self-regulatory models um, on the online space in general. We, have, we had a feeling that the, it doesn't really work. 
so we, there was a consensus that we needed to enforce some kind of legal framework to force companies to, um, you know, set up some basic standards. So some, some of those, some of those are some of the issues we, we discussed. If, is it okay, Tatiana, if I ask kind of yes. a, is more? So, so in, for, in all transparency, I'm in much to the, uh, I'm in, for all transparency, I'm a gamer, much to the, to, to the dis Gamer or gambler? Gamer. I'm a gamer, much to the dismay of my wife. And um, something that I've long noticed is because I have a very good friend that works for Blizzard Activision. And I've long asked him, I said, you know, why don't you come to the IGF? Why aren't you involved in it? And he's like, why, why should we be there? So I think a good question as well is if we're exploring this further in the future, how do we engage with gaming platforms? How do we get gaming companies, gaming platforms? How do they get them to the IGF? I think it's a pretty key stakeholder that we're missing. That is a good point. Actually, last year we had someone from a company who came from London, and I must say that, like most dynamic coalitions, we don't have a budget. So we were, you know, trying to find, be creative and find ways to invite someone who would be willing to pay, you know, to be self-funded. And we, we found someone from London and they came and they were, you know, not threatened by, you know, sort of a group of people who were going to ask very challenging questions about corporate social responsibilities, uh, safety standards, etc. But you have a good point. And actually yesterday we had a, a meeting of our own members and we did discuss that we need to engage more, generally speaking, um, gaming, you know, uh, companies, but also more tech uh, companies within our own dynamic coalition. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Oh. Thank you very much. And are there any questions? There, there are. Yeah, hello. We have one question. Um, and the question is from Jean-Philippe and Ruben. And he asks, uh, what does the panel think about the US Children's Pro Internet Protection Act, uh, short CEPA, um, which addresses concerns about children's access to obscene or harmful content over the internet? And um, CEPA actually requires some schools and libraries to use internet filters and implement other measures to protect children from harmful online content. Um, and they have to do it to get some federal funding. Yes, yes. sir, please. Um, I'll take this one, I guess. Um, CEPA, so our American colleagues, um, yeah, have been working within the boundaries of CEPA for many years. Um, if I remember correctly, it ties, uh, federal funding is tied to it, uh, which could mean that libraries would have to institute uh, filtering on their public access computers. And when the librarians found that that would actually extend beyond children to adults, the vast majority of libraries found ways wherever they could to forego the funding. So I think it's an example of something that perhaps was well-intentioned but uh, has consequences that go beyond uh, what it set out to achieve. Um, and the library community more generally is against sort of filtering of the internet kind of more fundamentally. We believe in education and we believe in, in sort of uh, you know, acceptable use policies rather than mandating strict filtering. That said, you can still find it in places, but I think that SEPA has some flaws which the community in the US has tried to work around. Thank you very much. And Hi. Um, one of the things that is a concern when addressing children's rights online especially is that um, very concerningly in many, many countries it often becomes protectionist and not a rights-based approach to addressing uh, children's rights online. And I think that's a trap which we need to be very, very wary of. Right? Because when we speak about harmful content which we're protecting children from, and it inevitably in many countries becomes women and children. It's never men and children. It's always women and children. And when we talk about harmful content, it's also important to deconstruct what is this harmful content, right? They are rarely referring to videos of burglary. They're often re related to content on sexuality, right? And um, when it becomes a protectionist approach towards addressing sexuality, it becomes concerning because in many places, um, sexuality, it, it, what it creates is that is this, it makes sexuality seem like the shameful thing which everyone needs to be silent about. And that is a very, very dangerous precedent to set because if you don't understand sexuality, then you will not be able to understand when your consent is being violated. You will not be able to understand, um, you know, sexuality in a healthy and a holistic manner. 
And I think this is something which we need to like talk about more openly. Thank you. And I wonder if Dynamic Coalition on Child Safety <laughs> can talk about this balanced approach in this Expand sense. a little bit, yes. So, of course, um, I, I don't think anyone wants to criminalise, well, yeah, some people do actually, <laughs> want to criminalise uh, uh, sexuality among, um, let's say, above the age of sexual consent, where it's legal, uh, but, but we also have to distinguish um, when we discuss, we have to acknowledge that there are harmful contents and we have to provide uh, rules around that and also uh, discuss with platforms. Um, there are a number of tools where that can be used, like edge verification, etc. There are studies showing that overexposure or exposure to adult pornography is harmful to children in Australia. They, I mean, and, and perhaps overexposure. Uh, it's quite a complex uh, a topic. Also, we know that in some countries, this is an excuse for uh, indeed um, sort of uh, blocking access to, um, f for children and for adolescents uh, uh, to some online sites. Uh, this is kind of a discourse to, you know, to, to actually um, practice censorship. And, and there are cultural factors, religious factors. Uh, you go and visit some countries and they use this as a, that, that's their main fear. It's not actually the children as victims, but it's the exposure of children to those contents. So, um, and depending on the level of maturity and, and the knowledge and awareness of the policy makers, uh, it's sometimes quite difficult to engage in, in a meaningful discussion with them. Thank you very much. And I'm sure that this discussion really deserves the entire session. If there is a quick response to that, I will be happy to take one minute and then we will move to other dynamic coalitions, but we may, maybe we will have time for more discussion later. Thank you. I completely agree with you. I, I, there is no, um, and if there is a reason why there is an age of consent, there is, and, and um, are these, uh, these are definitely not uniform across the world. And I completely agree with you on there are, that there are harms, of course, to being exposed to violent content and other harmful content. Uh, what I uh, and, and my I think we are coming from the same space that you involve the children in the discussion around this as well. So I, you know we are on the same page on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we are moving to the next block, which is focusing uh, dynamic coalitions, which are focusing mostly on the issues of innovation infrastructure, but which feeds other sustainable development goals like smart cities or zero hunger, because it's all based on technologies. And the first dynamic coalition I want to ask a question is dynamic coalition on DNS issues. DNS issues are very close to my heart. I think that um, we have speaker Nicholas Smith, right? Right. First of all, Nicholas, congratulations. Uh, I know that your Dynamic Coalition is one year old exactly at this IGF. I saw from your submission that you focused a lot on the universal acceptance. How does this feed into the achievement of sustainable development goals? What are your plans for the future as well? Because I know that one year for the Dynamic Coalition, it is a lot, but at the same time, it is not a lot of time. So if you could update us on your work and your future goals, thank you. Well, first, thank you, uh, Tatiana. Thank you, Michael. Um, it's an honor, as you said, a year in the making. Um, walking out of a session that we had uh, yesterday, uh, the room was quite full, so I think there's going to be even greater expectations uh, going forward in 2020. Um, but how this all ties together um, really starts with a simple premise about the multilingual internet, right? When we think about where we want to take um, aspects of the DNS, right, and how we really want to make it a universal acceptance piece. Um, one of the things that our DCs uh, focused on this year really was that aspect of universal acceptance. And what we wanted to strike it on was starting with looking at kind of the, the prime topic of where could we go to process this information. We started looking at um, a survey that we conducted um, earlier this year on bringing kind of the public sphere into the space with governments, um, which ultimately would tie back into SDG 9, which is talking about innovation, resilience, and infrastructure. But what we came out through exercises, whether it was a survey or through our membership, is that there was different approaches to how to get there, right? 
but we all agreed on the simple premise that a multilingual internet is where we need to be, right? That's, that's the future. So um, one of the things that um, you know, we, we tried to stress throughout this year is we were on a huge campaign, basically. Um, we started um, in Paris last year. Uh, we spent most of this year um, having consultations at the MAG meetings in Geneva. Um, we were at Eurodig um, earlier this year in The Hague, um, ICANN meetings. Um, so I think um, one of the key pieces here is how we work collaboratively um, to address these issues, but at the same time, we don't want to duplicate what some of the great work that some of the issues that ICANN is also facing as well. Um, so that's something that, that we're, we're taking very seriously. Um, just kind of going back to um, the innovation piece um, and where we want to go, um, so far, um, right now, uh, as I mentioned earlier at the outset, we, we did have an initial survey. Um, where we want to go next year is we want to have maybe a comprehensive survey um, where we have um, you know, different languages um, in that aspect, right? Um, one of the things that uh, we continuously try to address is how do we get the influencers in these conversations? Where do we go, right? Is it you know, at the state government? Is it at the, the federal level? Where are the penetration points uh, where we can have the greatest success in achieving the multilingual internet? Um, I'll stop there. Um, Thank you very much. And I have a quick question because you, um, you have not exceeded your time. Um, do you collaborate with ICANN community on such t very technical issues as, for example, IDNs? So that's, that's one piece of it. Um, we leave um, a lot of the technical aspects to ICANN where we found this unique space within the IGF to talk about these issues with governments as well, right? Um, as I said, we don't want to interfere what um, the UASG is already doing and what they've been doing. And also, too, with IETF, that's, that's a whole kind of separate entity. But at the same time, we want to complement what they're doing um, in that process. So translating technical work into policy work and vice versa. That's correct. Thank you very much. Um, so moving on to the next one, I'm, we're going to come to, the, to um, Carla Reyes at the DC on blockchain. And now um, it's... Regardless of how one feels about this technology, it is definitely here to stay, and it is very much connected to SDG9. And so, a lot of the work that your DC has been doing recently is specifically on the tension between decentralized autonomous systems, which for anyone unfamiliar is essentially another name for a network, but so let's say these decentralized networks, these decentralized ASs, um, and the current legal and social frameworks. How do you foresee our ability uh, as the internet community kind of going forward to unlock the potential for this innovation uh, of decentralized structures, assuming it can be, and how does your DC contribute to this? Yeah, so um, I've been involved since um, Guadalajara, as someone else mentioned. Um, and since that time, and even through this year's focus, although the focus has been slightly different, um, to look at decentralized autonomous organizations, um, the entire time the focus is on capacity building. So it's a little different for us whether we're looking at um, the SDGs and how we can advance those as a coalition, or whether we're just looking at blockchain technology as it relates to internet governance more broadly. There's a temptation always to um, think of specific use cases, but as you do that, you both become the blockchain, blockchain, blockchain group, which we are not, uh, and you run the risk of um, preferencing one instantiation of the technology over another, which we absolutely do not do, right? So our goals have long been and continue to be capacity building in one of several ways. One is uh, capacity building initially was to um, remind the innovators that they weren't innovating in a vacuum. Um, we sort of started over with the um, regulations don't touch us um, discussion from the uh, 90s and the internet. Um, and then similarly, um, we uh, work on capacity building with the general public to remind them that this is just another technology, it's an innovative one, but any innovative technology does not necessarily mean that it will be used to further innovation. You may just end up using it to 
reinvent uh, centralized old structures if you're not careful, um, because humans are humans and humans are behind it after all. Now, when it comes to decentralized autonomous organizations in particular, um, both lawyers and regulators um, academics and the technologists in the space have become quite sophisticated. And so there's been an emerging literature asking whether um, DAOs can be uh, legally formalized entities, right? And the problem becomes that um, there are entities that exist across the world, like literally, because they're decentralized systems. So which jurisdictions laws would apply? Um, how does... Uh, what does that look like? Um, and uh, to what extent do folks building them have to interact with a specific jurisdiction or can they continue to remain essentially decentralized because interacting directly may require some kind of centralization. So the goal has been both, again, capacity building, understanding that when we use that term, we're not talking about one specific thing, but rather a spectrum. As I've heard many of uh, my colleagues mention, everything is on a spectrum and there's a, a spectrum of uh, things that count when people are, are using that term. Uh, and then um, trying to build uh, in a, a multi-stakeholder fashion frameworks um, to help regulators and lawyers and technologists um, both speak about these things in a way that everybody in the room understands, right, which is actually quite difficult, uh, and um, also uh, to think about just the, the principles that you would want in, a, in, for, in this example, um, regulation that uh, formalizes or allows for formalized um, representation of decentralized autonomous organizations. We do that similarly and have done that similarly in other areas of innovation as the community becomes particularly interested in one thing or another. And um, before, for example, it was in um, uh, capital raising uh, via decentralized means uh, and going forward, given the work that we've done this week in designing the work program going forward, there's interest in um, understanding data protection uh, in blockchain uh, context and decentralized autonomous organization context. Uh, and there's interest in not forgetting to continue to do the basic capacity building with the public of this is not blockchain, blockchain, blockchain land, um, right? We, we need to talk about like what does it all mean? How do you separate hype from uh, reality so that we are talking about real things and not say Skynet, right? Um, so yeah, that's what we're up to. Thank you for that very pragmatic approach as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I want to move to another dynamic coalition, dynamic coalition on the Internet of Things, and see how we can separate hype from reality here. Because we know that Internet of Things is everywhere, every eye is on it, and we know that it contributes a lot to achievement of sustainable development goals, like from pacemakers that someone can have to smart cities, it's everywhere. But at the same time, as a cybersecurity researcher, I opened the newspapers and media and I saw a lot of headlines which use almost military language that IoT can be weaponized as a tool for a major cyber attack. So Martin Boterman, who is the representative of the um, Dynamic Coalition um, on IoT, I want to ask you a question. How do we make those devices secure and safe from two perspectives and users? who are mostly irrational than rational, but also complex security measures on the industry side. How can we separate this hype from reality and how can we bring industry and users' perspective together? I know that for me it's, it's not a long time, but please try. I'll try to do it in Sweden. Uh, basically, the points you make are very good, and uh, IoT is just part of that internet, and it, it's perpetrating a, per perpetrating a life. It, it's everywhere. You mentioned even in the veins, but also in particular for uh, develop if you see about eradicating hunger, these technologies are so important, and uh, increasingly so, also for crop management and things like that. Uh, they make a big difference. There's no doubt about it, we need it. So how do we prevent it from being abused or uh, being used for other purposes? Uh, there's two sides. One is that you could use these devices to launch massive DDoS attacks against targets. So you use them basically to reflect and to send out a lot of things at the moment that you think they're, that's useful. And it's possible because many of those devices out there today are very poorly protected. So that's one thing. The other thing is that you can use the device to attack the user itself. 
Um, it's clear how you can uh, destroy crops, which in wars may be a useful thing, or terrorism may be a useful thing. It's clear how you can uh, use those things that are connected to the body to attack the body directly, or just to, in to tease somebody, your, your, your former uh, spouse, uh, by raising the temperature in his house to above normal temperatures. It may sound ridiculous, but because of the market and the world developing, you can buy these services, the bad services as well. So it's clear that we need to do something about it. And in that, I very much agree there is a distinction between who is using it. From professional users, from companies, from governments who use it to measure traffic density or whatever, you can expect that they take the appropriate measures they have the ability to hire the, the, the right capacity, et cetera, in-house. In consumers don't have that, so, so we need to help consumers. We need to help by raising awareness. These newspaper articles, in a way, help to sensitize, to be more curious, like, how can I do this in a responsible way? But also by grading services and devices, certifying them in a way of how well they are to be secured, how well they're using data, and protect the data that may be private. So raising awareness, making sure that users are per product, per service, more aware of the risks is an important step there. And it's not enough. Uh, we need to help more. Not only because there are already many devices out there that are not protected or not fulfilling any criteria, but also because new devices will be made that will not fulfill this criteria, but may just be cheap or fun. Uh, so one of the things that you can do is offer consumers a front door lock, just like they may keep their money in a drawer that is not unlocked and their keys in another drawer that's not unlocked. As soon as you got through the front door, you can find it and take it. Electronic locks exist as well. The other thing is that you cannot leave it to the consumers alone. Stronger, you can't even leave it to the the suppliers of tools and services alone. We need to all be involved. It means that also the access provider needs to be aware what's coming from that. Should I uh, transfer it? And that means that you need the systems approach to really secure the whole network. And that's the only way forward. We're working on it. We're beginning on it. And we're not there yet. But we'll be. It needs to happen. Thank you very much, Martin. Do we have Atena. any interventions or questions? Yes. yes. I actually yeah, can, I can please. spend a little bit. Thank you, sorry. So as an example of collaboration among DCs, uh, two years ago we had, a, I mean, our, our DC organized a, a session, a thematic session on Internet of Things related to, you know, toys and, and devices that children use. So under this broad category that Mar Martin just mentioned, I think there is this, this um, subcategory where you have children uh, are as users of those devices, uh, consumers slash users. And I, I know Martin agrees, and I hope everyone does, that when we talk about children as users slash consumers, uh, we, we shouldn't um, um, think of them as, as them as users being responsible for whatever, you know, um, misuse uh, is happening um, because of the age range, number one. And number two, companies have, uh, should be implementing higher standards in terms of safety and, and, and protection. And we do know that data is being collected, um, you know, about children. Uh, not necessarily encrypted. Uh, we don't really know what happens. This is data of users who have less than 18 years old. Um, there are also other issues. For example, there is a doll, uh, a toy that um, is engaging in a conversation, sort of an AI-based uh, tool with, with the children. And one company um, enabled the toy um, um, to detect signals of abuse or, or some kind of a, a grooming conduct. Uh, so engaging with, in a conversation with the, with the child. And so we have to discuss issues around liability um, because the response of the toy to the child is, oh, this sounds like something important. You should talk to a grown-up about that. So what happens if, if the grown-up is actually the one who is abusing the child? Uh, what happens if the child doesn't 
act on this or the company doesn't have an alert system that is, you know, uh, uploading this and, and, and does nothing? Where, where does the liability lie? So um, there are more questions than answers, but I think those are very relevant. Thank you so much. And it also shows us how these different dynamic coalitions are actually connected to each other in their work. Uh, are there any questions? Because I do want to ask um, um, Martin and Carla a question. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, please. That's all right. I uh, just wanted to also mention um, the liaison between uh, the Disability and Accessibility DC and the DC on IoT. Two years ago, um, we organised a workshop on IoT and accessibility, and uh, Martin um, participated in that, and Vince Cerf did as well, and we had a broad cross-section of panellists. And there were a number of issues that came up. Interoperability was very important for us in regard to um, people say with physical disability who have some assistive technology and how does that work with a smart device in a smart home. Uh, also it was about user interfaces, that the user interfaces in, in IoT devices are going to be accessible for a person with a disability. So they were just two aspects that came out and we look forward to a continuing liaison with the DC on IoT. Thanks. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Here comes my question. You don't have to answer it, but both blockchain and IoT come up frequently with the issues of regulation. If you could implement one regulation which would enable or restrict something, what this should be, or you, would you tell me that, no, leave us alone, we don't need regulation, we will see, fix ourselves? Thank you. Uh, the answer, so at, at this point I'm speaking for me. Yes, 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 uh, only, only for you in your personal capacity. Um, I, I would say the answer can't be leave us alone. Uh, we lost that battle a long time ago, right? Um, the, but, we, but we would call for technology neutral rules um, because the risk you run when you make something specific to say blockchain technology is either that you define the law poorly and then it doesn't actually cover blockchain technology because you made something up, right? Or um, that you've defined or targeted what exists now and tomorrow that's not what will exist. Uh, and so we would encourage technology neutral rules um, that cover activities that you conduct through the technology and not the technology itself. Thank you. Martin? So just to complete, actually we also work with the uh, Dynamic Coalition on Core Internet Values and tomorrow we'll even have a combined session starting at 9.30. It was the advertising slot. Thank you very much. So but, uh, on legislation, let's not forget a lot is already out there. Uh, for instance, planes, cars, they're all full with IoT devices and they are regulated. They need to have a certain safety. So that's key. But if there would be one regulation that I would like, then that would be the regulation of responsible behavior. Uh, act responsibly. And uh, good practice or best practice examples uh, allow to set a standard there that will grow over the years. Thank you very much. I see a couple of hands. <laughs> oh, thank you. So, interesting debate, technology neutral rules. Uh, we are in favor of it, uh, but that requires to train uh, judges and prosecutors so that they do understand how to interpret the law in light of new trends. And this is actually happening, for example, for remotes, uh, abuse of children and the laws are defined, let's say rape, you, you need hands-on sort of, you know, sexual contact to, 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 to have a rape uh, criminal as a criminal conduct. So in some countries they already determined that um, um, on sexual grooming remote uh, qualifies as rape, but the judge has a very forward thinking uh, um, way of approaching the topic and, and it's not happening everywhere, but I think this type of jurisprudence can, can take the lead and, and show an example of good practice for other jurisdictions. Um. Mita, did you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, no, just uh, because one of the themes 
of this IGF is also data governance. There have been several instances of um, devices which are part of the IoT um, world collecting uh, data and information and um, um, and um, about the uh, of the, about the users without uh, prior consent and explicit consent. I was wondering if you would have any comments on that as well because it is a growing um, you know uh, world and the governments aren't actually matching up regulations or laws in that. And my question is also not for more regulations really, but like what are some things which we can work around that, you know, some sort of privacy by design, uh, rules of some sort, um, just like a comment or question. Thanks. I think you strike exactly an important point there. That is that we talk about ethics and values that are not everywhere the same in the world. And for instance, where Google Glasses by the Chinese police are accepted as something very useful, other countries may frown upon uh, such use of devices. Um, that's just one example. And uh, there's many more of those. And actually, tomorrow the focus will be on discussing those differences because they're crucial. We cannot, because most of us are still from Western Europe or North America in this uh, we cannot impose our values on the world. We need to open up. So this technology needs to facilitate the values in the regions where they are uh, exercised. So it's a very good point, and we're not there yet either, I would say. A quick comment on the technology neutral thing. Yes, So, uh, which is why we focus on capacity building right uh, in the dynamic coalition, because not just the judges that have to be educated, but then the technologists too. Right, the, the, that to the point um, from Martin about uh, existing rules, there's actually quite a lot that apply to activity on blockchain, and often technologists don't realize that until after they've built their thing, right? So it's really education for everyone. And I would say maybe as a qualifier to my earlier comments that technology neutral rules would be the default, uh, we would hope the default position, unless and until you can um, evidence that there is some sort of exceptional characteristic about the technology that requires something very specific, but that's a pretty high bar to set. Thank you very much for such an interesting and lively discussion and we are moving to and the last block. Before we move on, I had a question as well, Tatiana. Do you mind if I jump in? Um, or do we have no time? Yes, you have 30 seconds. <laughs> well, okay, I'll be very, very quick then. And that is because uh, one of the unfortunate um, shortcomings, in my opinion, of, of the SDGs is that there's, especially when it comes to SDG 9, is that there's not as many uh, connections between uh, infrastructure um, between infrastructure and then, for instance, climate action, um, uh, sustainable production and consumption, and especially clean energy and, and uh, you know, these kinds of new energy technologies that we need. And especially when it comes to blockchain and IoT, one of the biggest, uh, I don't know if you're smiling because you know where I'm going with this, one of the biggest criticisms that we've seen of both is the energy intensiveness of both of these, the lack of necessarily uh, sustainability um, integrated into the design, especially of IoT. And so I really would like for you to explore, because this is really something we do not talk about enough, especially considering how the kind of crisis that we're currently in. What do you recommend, or how do you think we should go forward in this and engaging with this when it relates to ensuring that sustainability is built into these technologies, that we're creating technology in such a way that it respects the planet that we're living on, and can, how can we go forward in this uh, with this in mind? It's two different problems between blockchain, Bitcoin, and that kind of generating a lot of computer activity. Uh, but for IoT, I would say two things. One, without IoT, we cannot keep track of that and manage our landscape. For instance, uh, air quality snuffers will automatically be connected to ring road traffic indications that will reduce the, the speed uh, obligatory if the, the amount of uh, ozone uh, uh, polluters gets too, too high. That's one example where you see it's intricately uh, connected. And you need IoT for that purpose. So it's not only using energy, but it's also giving that what we need. It can measure pollution in oceans, saliation in, in, in water, uh, temperature rise, etc. So that's one thing. Uh, the good news is that many of these devices that are not connected to the grid, they are built to be as energy efficient as they can be because it's very difficult to keep them loaded. Examples range from solar-powered uh, devices, because then you don't need to renew that, 
until uh, very light use of batteries. Uh, and there's an incentive in the way we use them to reduce the energy use. So that, that's the advantage. But uh, otherwise, uh, a good point. Yeah, so for us, it's a little bit more difficult to make a definitive statement because we, become, we come pretty close to, we would come pretty close to advocating for one instantiation of the, a consensus mechanism over another, which we do not want to do, right? But what we can do is point out trade-offs when you make choices about your, the consensus mechanism that you use in a protocol versus, so in terms of energy um, or sustainability, right, <laughs> versus, say, sec security, and what those trade-offs might look like and the principles that you might think through when designing a protocol. Um, we think maybe that's a better role for the dynamic coalition than saying, this one is good and this one is bad because of energy intensivity or something, right? Um, um, and maybe that's all I'll say on that. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Great question and great discussion. Thank you. And now, <laughs> unless <laughs> we have more questions, I'm very keen to move to the last block. We have four more dynamic coalitions and they are working on peace, security, strong institutions, but their work is also related <coughs> directly to reducing inequality and to industry innovation and infrastructure and to many other goals. And I would like to start with the Dynamic Coalition on Internet Rights and Principles uh, with um, their representative Minda Moreira. I know that you are most like the, the coalition for internet rights and principles directly is connected to sustainable development goal number 13, um, peace, justice, and strong institutions. But I also see from your submission that you work on reducing inequality, <coughs> on access to the internet for marginalized groups and minorities, such as refugees. I would like you to tell us a bit more about this work, and I also know that for years you have been working on implementation on, um, on the Charter on Human Rights and Principles on the Internet. How do, how do these two come together? How is your work going? What are your plans in this regard? Thank you. Um, thank you. It's a very good question. And uh, uh, refugees' rights is uh, something that we have been uh, working and focusing on, on over the last past years. And uh, it has directly to do with uh, um, the Charter, because uh, uh, basically um, we have the uh, Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet, and uh, uh, that has uh, 21 uh, rights and 10 broad principles. And uh, so our work is uh, uh, mainly outreach through the Charter. So uh, what we did is to look at the, those rights and to see uh, which groups need to have their uh, human rights protected in the online environment. And the refugees and migrants were one of those groups. So we looked firstly on the, the right to access the internet and uh, it was uh, one of the things that we noticed is uh, when we come to uh, um, refugees, not this uh, simple right to access is not as black and white as it seems. So not everyone uh, who has, is a refugee has the uh, right to access. And if they are in detention centers, they might be very monitored and uh, the access that they have is very reduced indeed. Uh, uh, we also talked about other groups uh, for instance, the uh, homeless uh, people, like for instance in UK, that if you don't have uh, an address, it is very difficult to then get online, um, on a library, on anywhere. So uh, the right to access was uh, uh, something that was definitely to look into. But then we went to also the right of non-discrimination and internet access use and governance, uh, directly linked to these uh, minority groups. Uh, the right to privacy uh, on the internet and the right to digital uh, data protection. So all these are rights that we have uh, inside the charter. And uh, for instance, in the case of uh, uh, refugees, we 
thought that it was really important to address the right to privacy, uh, to sorry, to privacy in, on the internet because uh, this was not happening uh, in detention centers or even uh, when they have to ha have their basic access, um, basic needs. Um, uh, to access the internet, to deal with their families, to look for information, uh, even to keep safe. Uh, and, uh, and so we thought that it was really important to look into that and to the right to digital uh, data protection. So last year we focused on the uh, refugees and also uh, 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 artificial intelligence, emerging technologies, blockchain technologies. Uh, and one of uh, the concerns was the uh, use of uh, emerging technologies or artificial intelligence in uh, refugee uh, camps, uh, sometimes as an experiment. And uh, our question is, who is accountable? Where does the data go? Uh, where is the right, uh, the rights of these refugees being protected? Uh, is there any transparency? Is there any groups working together, a government, uh, civil society, uh, the refugees themselves? Uh, and so these were all very important questions that we, we wanted to address uh, through the charter and uh, the, the, the work that we have been doing. Um, yeah, <laughs> I hope I responded. <laughs> Thank you so much for showing us yet another angle of connecting the unconnected in a way of, in, of, of inclusion of those who are excluded for now, but another angle, not from the technical point of view, but from the point of view of human rights. And I will... Of human rights, but also especially as it relates to accountability. Of accountability with these massive data sets that we are generating, that are being generated in the digital age. And with that, I think it's a really good segue, actually, into this idea of responsibility. And so I want to I go over to Nicola, uh, Nicolo um, Zingales now, and I want to I bring you into this to talk a little bit about more about what we've all been hearing on the agenda lately as it relates to platform responsibility. We see these, we, we hear some variation of this in one way or another, uh, you know, coming up on the agenda, but mostly um, it's in a worrying way. It tends to focus on content regulation, it tends to um, focus on restrictions, and it doesn't often include, for instance, market failure. And so I really want you to address something, at least from the point of view of the work that you've been doing over the past year and um, over the past five years. Congratulations on celebrating your fifth year anniversary at the IGF. And um, what is your work focusing on now? And you know, how has it evolved over those years? Especially seeing that you explore this issue from the perspective of collective governance. And kind of what, how does that contribute to achieving the SDGs? Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, so our work over the past five years uh, has mainly trying to move on from uh, some vague principles that are the UN guiding principles on human rights, uh, business and human rights, and try to uh, come to a shared understanding of how a responsibility is to be implemented by online platforms. And uh, it really uh, is linked to the concept of responsibility itself, which is, in one way, it is about being responsive to a community. So it's not just an individual implementation by a specific platform, but it's about how we understand as a community the responsibility of online platforms. And secondly, is about um, responding in a way that is commensurate to your power in society. So that touches upon the other issue that you mentioned, which is the market failures. Uh, so in the first part of our activities, we uh, try to define uh, what the concept of responsibility means. And then we have... Um, try to operationalize it in the context of um, the right to remedy. So try to understand how uh, the dispute resolution mechanism could uh, help um, platforms fulfill their obligations to respect uh, human rights. Um, we have then done um, a survey of uh, the dispute resolution mechanisms available in different platforms. And we have, in doing that, um, come up with some best practices, identified what are the best ways of um, 
providing for a right to remedy. Uh, but at the same time, we understood in doing that that there are uh, very different approaches which are informed, in fact, by different values that are promoted by all these platforms. So in the last uh, year, we have uh, gathered uh, some contributions by our members on um, what are the values that should be promoted in platform regulations, both by regulators and the platforms th themselves. And in doing that, we, are, we have tried to connect the two issues of social values on one way, uh, on one hand, and on the other hand, uh, the economic value. So um, how much is the value produced by platforms? How much is it being extracted by other players who are relying on their systems? And how can we uh, reconceptualize regulation in a way that ensures uh, an harmonious development between uh, the production of value on the one hand and the respect for social values that we all care about. So values like democracy, the protection of environment, uh, fundamental rights, labor standards. So I think that now we have uh, identified the need to uh, not only understand what these values are, but also have um, some sort of shared understanding that can inform regulators in the future. So with regard to your uh, more uh, future-oriented question, what we are going to do, um, we identified the need to uh, come up with some uh, definitions, principles uh, that can be used by regulators in uh, um, harnessing value, uh, you know, and helping platforms to uh, generate value in a way that is soci uh, socially beneficial. So for the next year, we want to uh, create a glossary of terms that are key for platform regulation and perhaps a handbook that helps uh, regulators implement uh, those principles. Perfect. Thank you so much. Tatiana. Do we have any questions? We don't have any questions from remote participants. I have a question. <laughs> when we are talking about platform regulation, I would say five years ago, it was, it was almost an unthinkable term. Why would we regulate platforms? They should prosper, they should flourish and go their own way. So do you think regulation, and maybe this is the question for both of you, because you're both working on human rights and principles and accountability. Do you think that regulation could be instilled or developed in such a human rights-centric way that they will already be there? Should it come from the governments because platforms or, or societies failed? to preserve this or to adhere this? Do you think regulation will fix and can, be, can it be developed in such a rights respecting w uh, a way that it will? I know that this is a complex question, but yes. Um, yeah, it's a very complex question, but I think that what we are advocating for is for um, uh, human rights uh, by design so that human rights are there and everything that is worth is worth upon it. So our frameworks are there. Uh, and then the other way that uh, uh, companies and organizations and, uh, have, have uh, uh, other ways to access as well, uh, to see if these human rights uh, are being followed or not. So, and in this, uh, this assessment cannot be done just by the companies themselves. It has to be externally, so to make sure that actually it works. Uh, so, for me, human rights by design is uh, a very important one. Um, yes, I largely agree with that. Um, I would say that um, there is uh, a, a positive duty for states to ensure that human rights are respected. So you can, in principle, uh, leave the market to fix the problem, but the state cannot um, fail to monitor uh, the situation. So if, to the extent that self-regulation is not working, then we will need uh, the state to, to come in. And I think um, it also is important in that regard to recognize uh, that in a platform-based society, there is not one state, but I think the whole international community needs to coordinate and ensure that these problems are solved. Thank you very much. And the very last question, uh, maybe to both of you, but mainly to Nicola. How do you think, how much share or part in negotiating this regulation or developing this regulation those platforms should take? Should they sit with the governments and develop them together or should governments be more on their own in regulating the platforms? 
Well, this is a million dollar question. I think it, it will depend on the, uh, the issue that we are looking at. So as we know from the intergovernance context, uh, the roles and responsibility of stakeholder are different depending on what we are trying to regulate. So again, we need to, I think, for an enlightened regulation, what we need to do is, first of all, understand what are the value that we want to promote, uh, and then think about what are the best strategies to achieve those values. And often, we fail to do the first task, mm -hmm. which is quite important to make sure that we are actually fixing the problem and not creating new ones. And in our um, special issue that we, um, so I should have mentioned, we produced uh, um, a special issue of a journal uh, that uh, we distributed yesterday and is available on open access. We also uh, provided some examples uh, of regulation that failed to understand what the real production of value was as opposed to extraction of value. And by failing to do that, it has created some unintended consequences. Just to be crystal clear why I ask these questions, because I know that in the past one or two years, many stakeholders felt extremely uncomfortable then when, social, when there were calls for regulation of social platforms. There were sometimes activities with governments and social platforms hiding behind the closed doors and drafting this regulation on their own. And this, this is one of the reason, reasons why I actually ask how much comfort, how, how much comfortable we are feeling with this kind of setting. There would be regulation, but developed together. Yes, please, Minda. Um, yes, so it is important that there has uh, regulation. If, uh, as, is, as uh, uh, we were talking before, uh, if you do it uh, together it, or separately, it really depends on the issue. But I think that it's always important that there are a group of uh, different uh, stakeholders working together on issues. And it's uh, one thing that we were discussing yesterday on the workshop of um, uh, uh, data governance by AI, 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 uh, sorry, AI uh, putting human rights at risk was um, uh, about exactly this, because sometimes uh, regulators are not um, completely aware of the issues of uh, artificial intelligence. So you, you need a group of people working together so that everyone knows what we are uh, regulating about and what outcomes uh, we want to achieve. Thank you very much. And I see Chris Christopher has an intervention, but I want to ask, do we have dynamic coalition on AI? Not yet. Not yet, yeah. So I love the question, and we're fortunate to have it because one of the world's ex experts on this approach called co-regulation is with us, which is Chris Marsden. I know I cited him in many of my articles, basically and, in every. And you're getting at you know, what is a, a very co a, a controversial question in the academic literature, which is the entire IGF is based on a multi-stakeholder approach, which means engaging everybody in the belief that will improve outcomes. And there is a wide range of regulatory techniques where it's not just the government acting unilaterally, but you engage and work together. There is some criticism of that approach that it gives the regulated companies too much influence over the outcome. And we're struggling to develop boundaries about how that works, but I would have to admit, um, they're, they're not very well developed as of yet, and it's more ad hoc analysis feeling your way through it uh, but I do think that there's probably merit on both sides to this, I and mean, it's, it's uh, a very difficult balance to strike. I want to jump in here real quick, just because we're talking about platforms, and, and I want to kind of address a somewhat v uh, uncomfortable question. It's probably controversial. Maybe I shouldn't even be asking this, but it, I feel like it's something that we need to raise. Because to me, the elephant in the room when it comes to platform responsibility is the business model. I'm sorry, but the fact is, I mean, it's, it's the, the paradigm of surveillance capitalism has been shown time and time again that that is what we're dealing with. And so when it comes to platform responsibility, how are we supposed to hold or, you know, company is responsible when their business model directly undermines, potentially, anyways, if I'm trying to be more diplomatic, this, uh, this entire endeavor. And I open that to anyone, especially you, Nico, or anyone else who can address this. And I'm sorry again. Sorry, not sorry. Well, uh, I would say change the business model if it's not uh, compatible with the law. I mean, I, 
of course, there are different ways of fitting into this surveillance capitalism definition. So there is a way to collect data and use data that, that is compatible with data protection law. So the fact that you have uh, two masters, so users on one hand and advertisers on the other, does not mean that you maximize the collection of personal data and you optimize for uh, forcing the user to spend as much time as possible on the platform to collect data. You can do that in a responsible way, uh, which is what our uh, SDG was, so responsible uh, production and consumption. I think there's uh, multiple ways, and the fact that um, we don't have a definition of what uh, value means in a platform-based society is precisely what creates uh, a, a, a very wide range of uh, um, opportunities to escape the responsible uh, uh, way of implementing this business. So if, if you can define clearly what value is and how it should be implemented, then we won't, won't have you know, all the excesses that we are uh, witnessing and that were criticized as part of that book. John? Uh, if I may, I was waiting for, for my turn to, to give my intervention. But we know what the value is in a platform society. It's a, an advertising value, and that's the only recognized incentive that platforms have at the moment. And in the programmatic advertising world, that means one second view of an ad on online. And so what happens is that a whole uh, architecture of the platforms is optimized for that advertising economy of scale, which, as I will say in my intervention later, has led us to the whole black market of troll factories, content farms, and uh, uh, clicks, shares, and followers, which are now dictating our elections. And so one of our members, uh, Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, has published uh, just yesterday an article about another troll farm in Ukraine that has worked with almost all uh, layers of politicians during the elections. And you, if you look at Google troll farms, India, um, Serbia, other countries, you will see that this is becoming one of the very profitable businesses for developing countries. And I, will, I can give you some numbers, but I'm not going to, to take um, more of your time. And if I may, um, can I introduce you, Mira Milosevic? <laughs> representative of Dynamic Coalition of Sustainability of journal Journalism and New Media. We will come to this coalition a bit later. I see that we have three more interventions. Please keep them as brief as possible, and then we will move to the last two Dynamic Coalitions. Thank you. I want to respond very quickly to what you said. I entirely share your concerns, and I, I see why you're mentioning that. And I don't disagree that uh, advertising and uh, the advertising model is one type of value that is being promoted by the platforms, but I don't think it is the only value, at least when you look at you know, their terms and conditions, their marketing material, you know, their statements, uh, they certainly recognize other values. The problem is we don't know how those values are balanced, and there should be more transparency, more accountability in uh, that kind of operation, that kind of balancing exercise. Three more interventions, starting with Christopher. Very quickly, I want to, Nico, I, and you know, I really commend you for the balanced approach to try to make this work. Um, there is actually work I've done, if you, there is an old economics of advertising, mostly from broadcast television, which has largely been lost in the internet debates, which is very influential, that shows the flaws. Uh, but on the other hand, there's the missing thing, which is consumer interests strongly favor advertising support. And this is the, the hard part of balancing. We could turn to a different business model, and there's some very good economic arguments for doing it, but consumers largely reject that. And they like a hybrid option of different things, and it's quite difficult to find that balance, particularly because it's not a uniform balance. What you care about for your healthcare information or your elections is different, or your financial information is different what you care about, your travel recommendations. Sure. And so finding a unified approach is gonna actually require a great deal of, of detailed work. Thank you. Thank you very much. So if you think of platforms like YouTube Kids, I mean, business model is to turn the kids into video consumers and advertisements. So the algorithm is, is being fed by that and, and influenced. And, and, and there's no 
um, the approach should be the educational value. Uh, if you think in terms of protection of children, it should be the educational value uh, of, the, of the content that they are looking at. Know, you know how much this will turn them into uh, video consumers. Thank you very much. Minda, did you have also an intervention? Uh, not specifically for this, so I, I will let the, the other coalition speak and then we'll come, come back. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Oh, you do. Uh, hi, I'm Chris. Uh, it's really important, I think, to, to think about the way in which uh, platforms operate in these areas. And I think that it is worth just flagging up. Tomorrow morning, 9.30, round one, round eins. Uh, there's a discussion about the way in which platforms have influenced elections in Brazil, the United States, and the Brexit referendum in the UK, organized by a Brazilian steering group. Uh, I would urge people to come along tomorrow morning, 9.30. Thank you very much, and I'm very happy that the two last but not least dynamic coalitions do not need much introductions anymore, at least in terms of who the speakers are, who the representatives are. So I want to move to the dynamic coalition on sustainability of journalism and news media. And um, Mira Milosevic, I know that you're, I think that you're the newest dynamic coalition here, but I see that you're doing a lot already, a lot of work on access to information as one of the, um, as one of the goals for sustainable development goals, peace, justice, and strong institutions. And as you're the newest one, what has been achieved so far? What, which work have you done and what are your plans for the future? Well, it's a, a, a good afternoon, everyone, and um, apologies for my passionate intervention. Uh, thank you for being here. It's very difficult for us to talk about what we've achieved uh, since uh, we have formally been launched yesterday. However, Congratulations. <laughs> however, the community that has, thank you very much, uh, the community that has worked uh, uh, with the uh, IGF Secretariat and MAG over the last couple of years to set up this uh, um, coalition has been very active in the sustainable development goals sphere. So a global forum for media development uh, where Michael and I come from has been working since 2014, even when the SDGs were formulated. And so we have uh, 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 been advocating uh, for a long time for introduction of freedom of expression and access to information into SDGs and we've succeeded. And so SDG 1610, uh, 10.1 and 10.2 are actually bringing access to information, freedom of expression, and other fundamental rights to the SDG framework. And we are happy to report that recently uh, the indicator on access to information, SDG 1610 -1, thanks to the work of many of our um, members and partners such as UNESCO, has been promoted to the tier one. So we have a lot of uh, uh, data on the progress on, on access to information. Uh, we also have uh, a lot of data on progress on uh, SDG 16101, which measures actually safety of journalists. However, it is a part of the wider SDG 16 um, goal on inclusive, just, and uh, peaceful societies. And if you look at the very interesting report from UNDP on goal 16 plus, as they call it uh, from this summer, they identify some very worrying trends. And one of the trends that they identify is rise in uh, violence, that a bottom million that we want to raise up from uh, uh, inequality actually lives, 80% of them live uh, in situations where they face conflict and violence. Uh, there are many negative trends and the community where we come from is also seeing uh, increased uh, impact of disinformation and misinformation, especially on uh, uh, information uh, ecosystem in the periods of elections, which Christopher will, will talk about uh, tomorrow. So, uh, what we were looking at uh, when we were looking at the SDG system, we, we saw that there is a little space for true multi-stakeholder cooperation, and also some of the problems that our journalists and colleagues are facing: security, uh, trolling, uh, uh, cyber attacks, uh, uh, also pressures from governments, but also existence of journalism, professional news, 
in the platform ecosystem is some, something that we should be addressing in a different fora. And that's why we thought that working with the different dynamic coalitions and working within the IGF system is the right thing to do. And thank you very much for uh, well, welcoming us. And as you can see, there is a lot that we need to learn and uh, a lot that we, we uh, still need to achieve. We're already cooperating uh, with our partners uh, to be present at the EuroDig. We'd, we've done that this year at the RightsCon. We are also working with UNESCO uh, and other partners to bring the Information Democracy Commission, Media Freedom Conferences, to bring our research and the voices of journalism, news media, freedom expression, and media freedom community uh, to, to, to this fora. It is because we believe that the regulation of the content layer of internet really needs to take into consideration not only fighting negative aspects, but also promoting the information and internet that we would like to see uh, uh, for tomorrow. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And I feel like every topic that we are touching here deserve, deserves actually not only two hour session, but probably a day of a conference or several days. But I also would like to say that it makes me ho so happy to see how your work is relating to each other. And I will pass the floor to Michael for the next question. Absolutely, and, and you know, thank you so much. And, and I think it's, I'm actually trying to make the connection here because to our Last, but definitely, as we said, not last, uh, not least speaker, um, uh, Christopher Marsden, because from what I hear, kind of a, a similar thread through all of this, it's accountability, it's uh, taking a rights-based approach to, con uh, to connectivity. And so um, Christopher works with, uh, is part of the DC for network neutrality. Um, and recently, recently over the past year, you've really been focusing on the compatibility of new technologies uh, with network neutrality, and uh, which of course relates to SDG nine, but it, it's you know about in infrastructure and innovation, but it also connects to uh, to like I said to human rights and to essentially the right to access um, freely. So, what would you uh, describe are some of let's say the negative impacts of new technologies such as five G, um, Internet of Things, obviously, and others. Unfortunately, Martin's not here to uh, potentially respond. And what can be done about these negative effects, especially in the context of your DC's works, as well as within the larger framework of the SDGs? So thank you. And I, I must say, I just want to acknowledge three groups of heroes. First of all, our moderators who have gone through uh, two hours of interlacing 12 of us. Uh, secondly, to the audience here in the room, thank you for being here. Please ask questions in the couple of minutes we have at the end. Otherwise, we'll wonder why you were here, other than it being a quiet room to do email. Uh, and also to acknowledge the uh, online audience, some of whom have stuck with us right until uh, 6.23 in the evening. Uh, I'm here actually as Luca Belli. Uh, Luca is the, uh, obviously the coordinator of the Dynamic Coalition on Net Neutrality, uh, which has been around for seven years, uh, from 2013. I guess we're one of the originals. Uh, I guess we're the trouble one, because <laughs> uh, we're the one which has uh, looked a lot at uh, real world effects of policies, which is a slightly un-IGF thing to be doing, uh, for which we've been fairly unapologetic. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge one more thing, by the way, which is that I'm a law professor in the United Kingdom, and I want to acknowledge the fact that my colleagues in the United Kingdom are on strike at the moment, uh, nationally, uh, in order to prevent the erosion of our pensions. So I just want to acknowledge that were I not here, I would be on strike in the United Kingdom. Okay, so I have now 2 minutes 48 seconds. I will ignore the clock that's in front of me. Uh, just to say, so the Dynamic Coalition has been constantly working towards the promotion of free and open internet access. Uh, for mo many of you in your country, you will have a law which is not called network neutrality, but which is called something like the open internet regulation or the open internet law. Uh, so I want to acknowledge that it could be called that. Um, and we've been developing research and policy proposals since 2013. As I say, Luca is the driving force we are uh, following on behind. We need to clone Luca because he does so much at IGF and other places around the world. Uh, and most notably, we've uh, been working with the model framework on net neutrality, which the Dynamic Coalition worked towards, and um, which has directly inspired the Council of Europe recommendation on net neutrality. So that was one of the early successes, which apparently became controversial, of the uh, Dynamic Coalition. Uh, in 2019, uh, as Michael said, we're working now on looking at the uh, compatibility or otherwise, uh, we don't want to prejudge, 
between net neutrality principle and development and internet access technologies and business models like 5G, like what's erroneously called the fourth industrial revolution, which is really the fifth, uh, and also the Internet of Things. Uh, one thing that we've produced as an outcome from this year is the uh, is a map of zero rating around the world. So if you go to zerorating.info, you will be able to get access to that map. It shows you where uh, subsidized offers are available. Um, if you go to net neutrality, uh, sorry, network neutrality, the full uh, title, .info, you will see our previous outputs. And I will say the outputs for the first three years, uh, Luca was working with uh, Primavera, uh, and we uh, produced these prodigious outputs, you know, four books in the first three years, uh, which is pretty extraordinary, with uh, four words by uh, people like uh, Vince Cerf and Tim Wu, Maricha Shaka, uh, contributions from Louis Pouzin. You know, there are many fathers of the internet. Uh, they do not include Tim Berners-Lee, he's a father of the web, but they do include Louis Pouzin as well as Vint and others. Uh, so we've been producing a, a huge amount of work, uh, and I just really want to acknowledge the contribution of, of, of everybody who's, who's been helping us along the way, um, uh, including, of course, we've looked at the work of Christopher. We need to acknowledge each other. He mentions me on co-regulation. I want to mention his work on net neutrality and the regulations that may have uh, perverse consequences as well as those that might be helpful. Um, I also want to acknowledge what I think is the real elephant in the room. So, Michael, you, you kindly mentioned uh, surveillance capitalism. And I just want to say that we have a lack of engagement uh, from industry. And we would want more and more engagement from industry. It may, you know, people might say, well, it's your fault. You're the dynamic coalition on net neutrality. You're going to annoy the telecom companies because you're talking about regulating what they do in a very light touch way, frankly. But we want more engagement with industry. Also, I should say that one of the things that we can help towards our work with the SDGs, and it's already been mentioned a couple of times, is working across dynamic coalitions as much as possible. So not just coming together in this assembly at the end of the IGF, but working together with, I know that the, you know, the youth IGF gets fired up by net neutrality. It's, it's a mass participation democratic area, uh, which comes as a huge shock to those of us who worked in telecom regulation when there were about 12 of us who used to work in it. But now it's millions and millions and millions. But also, I was about to suggest that we should have a dynamic coalition on disinformation. We don't need it because Mira already leads what will <laughs> deal with those issues, um, as well as with uh, human rights and fundamental values, as well as gender, because this is a gender issue, as well as those working on privacy by design and other things. So I think the more we work together across the dynamic coalitions, the more effect I think we can have, and the more we can remember that what we're working towards is an open and inclusive internet that will serve, I think, most of our purposes. I also want to acknowledge, and I want to call him by his formal title now, Professor Zingala's work on this. There's been huge interaction between the Dynamic Coalition on Net Neutrality and Platform Responsibility and Community Networking and, 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 and we want to do more in future. So let's make this something which can be really, let's coin the word, dynamic in future. Thank you very much, Chris. And we forgive you for running over time in your intervention right. because you're the last but not least coalition. We still have two minutes left. I think that we might go a couple of minutes over time. Are there any questions from remote participants? No. Seeing none, are there any questions from the audience? After Chris issued a plea, there is. Chris? Please, Can you come, uh, come forward. Do you need a microphone? Thank you. Yeah. As she's come forward, I just want to remind that there's also many mothers of the internet as well. So just, yeah. You can come to the table. I'm sure you Whatever can switch you on. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I'm Jennifer Boucher from r and Media. My question is for Mira. Congratulations, first of all, on launching the new Dynamic Coalition, one day old, <laughs> officially, right? Um, so, a really broad question um, to which there's no easy answer, but easy to pose, I think. What would, you, what would be your comment on state regulation when we know that the media are not always in good company when it comes to governments? Mm. Yes, so it's, it's a good question, thank you very much. Uh, journalists and media don't like regulation. And, uh, you know, of course we had broadcast regulation because of the spectrum frequency limitations 
and that there need to be someone to allocate it. But in, in, the, in the press, traditionally, self-regulation was something that was pre pre preferred. And in general, when we speak about freedom of expression, it would be the best for industry to regulate itself. And there was the big hope that that will, uh, that will happen with platforms as well and other spaces for expression online. Unfortunately, we are seeing that some of the attempts at establishing codes of practices uh, and self-regulatory mechanisms are not working. I'm not saying we should uh, abandon them. I'm not saying we shouldn't be working on platforms to see what exactly those values uh, uh, should be for everyone. Uh, but it seems that there is a need uh, for states to start looking into regulating less content, more of the marketplace, probably. Thank you very much. Any other intervention on this question? And do we have more? Because we are exactly at 6.30. So that's when the session is supposed to end. And it's not like I really want to wrap it up right now, but if there are questions or interventions, we will accept them. Yes, please. Well, again, I just want to commend uh, Michael Tatiana. This was a great session. And um, as, as Chris said, thank you for uh, waiting with us and hearing all our thoughts. I know we're kind of in between the food that's outside. Um, I, I kind of just, it's, Somewhat a rhetorical question, but I'm thinking about, we've heard a lot of great stories tonight and a lot of the, the achievements that the DCs are doing. Um, kind of a level setting question. Are there vehicles that the DCs within the UN or outside of the UN that we could be doing to strengthen to get to the goals of the SDGs? Just maybe a lightning round or any thoughts on that? Thank you. And I think we have a question as well. Yes. <clears throat> well, if I may, yeah. Very briefly, Nigel Hicks and I can. Uh, the talk on, on, on regulation, uh, so I suppose some of us have been sort of in this business for 25 or 30 years to try and not have uh, platform regulation. But what I wanted to ask the, the panel really is, is and, and really this has been spurred by, by Chris's intervention, and of course Chris and I go back a long time, perhaps me further, but the net neutrality approach was positive. It was positive in that it was regulation to open up the internet. Some of the talk of platform net regulation can be viewed as negative. Should we not be looking at some holistic positive regulation that enshrines the openness and the singularity of the internet and at the same time does something about competition? Thank you. Great question. And a question I note at, at 6.32, so I'm not sure how much we can answer it. Um, so yes, it, it, it's, it's very true that obviously those who have been working in this area a long time are very aware of the historical precedents for the things that we're trying to do. I, I think that one of the things about the, what's actually come out of the net neutrality debate is that it's, it's effectively pretty light touch regulation saying to, uh, to telcos, don't be evil. You know, don't block apps, don't do things which are obviously Harmful. I mean, frankly, I think there's very little more that can be done in terms of net neutrality regulation anyway because of the, the huge information imbalance in terms of trying to achieve transparency in the area. So I think it was something that was a, uh, seen as a giant problem and I think is now probably seen as something which, is, um, which can be regulated with a fairly light touch. In terms of the platforms, do come to the session tomorrow morning at 9.30. The things you will hear, well, they won't surprise Nigel, but they will... Um, probably illuminate some of the problems we have with platforms. I, I will just say one thing, which, which I, I mentioned in the Dynamic Coalition on, on platform responsibility, which is that electoral law is so inadequate in so many countries. I've been doing work for the European Parliament and for the Commonwealth, so in uh, Asia Pacific and in Africa in the Caribbean. It is shocking the degree to which we are unable to regulate, particularly election periods. Uh, and I think this is something which our political lords and masters and mistresses will be incredibly closely focused on because it's their jobs, right? If elections go wrong, that's how they get re-elected. Uh, and I will also say that on that, there's a specific problem, which is that we often talk in the IGF about the lack of technical ability. This is one area where actually politicians are very strongly motivated to understand what's going on. Um, but I would just say that the laws around disinformation online that are made are made after elections by the winners. 
So they're not always quite as rounded as we might hope that they are. But as I say, more tomorrow morning, 9.30, uh, in the workshop. Uh, thank you very much. And unless there is any pressing need for intervention, yes, uh, Minda, you can go. And Mira, okay. Two more, and then we will need to wrap it up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, one uh, question that is not a question, but maybe is a call for action, is that I thought that uh, uh, another uh, sustainable development goal would be addressed uh, in the session uh, uh, that is uh, uh, SDG 13 climate action. It was not. But I think it's a very important one, and I think all the dynamic coalitions uh, should work together on this. Uh, that is the climate emergency, climate crisis. So climate uh, uh, action is a very, very important one. We have been addressing this one this year through our uh, Article 4. Uh, and we would welcome anyone that would like to work with us for the next IGF to bring it not to our annual meeting, but to a proper main session. So um, if you would like to come and talk to me and talk to any one of our um, coalition, we would very much welcome this discussion for the next year or the next uh, uh, national IGF uh, too. So uh, it's really important. Young people are very dynamic on this. Uh, they, that's one of the things that they want to see the, uh, the uh, IGF community to address. And unfortunately, we are not talking about that enough. Thank you. I always say we can't legitimately discuss access unless we also address sustainability. So thank you so much for that, Minda. Amir? That was very similar to what I wanted to say. If we don't address all these issues, especially how we choose our uh, representatives in elections and how they make their decisions, we will never be able to reach goals defined by the Agenda 2030, and especially we won't be able to address climate change. So dynamic coalitions and this IGF structure is crucial and critical for addressing and achieving some of the SDGs. Thank you very much. And I want to say that I think that we made something impossible possible. 14 speakers in two hours, every voice heard, but I know that there was a suggestion for the wrap up as a compromise solution because we are really running seven minutes over time. Why don't you tweet it? It will reach the wider audience. Of course, it depends on you, but if you want to say briefly, as a wrap-up, how your dynamic coalition or dynamic coalitions in general can be a vehicle to achieve a sustainable development goal, tweet it. And I will pass it to Michael to wrap up. up. Thank you. I mean, I really, uh, Chris said it very well earlier. I, I, th I really see the DCs as being a, such a cohesive glue that really, in many ways, can, can keep, uh, can hold the IGF together. And so I really challenge us going forward over the next year and beyond to work together more cohesively, even more cohesively. This is a positive call to action, not a negative one. To work together more cohesively, for instance, inviting uh, each other to join uh, sessions e uh, even more so. Um, since especially we know how all of these interlinkages. And uh, with that said, I want to thank all of you, obviously, for being here, for taking the time to be here. You've really been amazing. Thank you all, the audience, for listening, for being here. Um, I also just want to quickly um, thank uh, Yuta and Marcus, who are both, uh, who are the um, DC coordination group um, kind of... Uh, uh, they're the ones that herd these cats together and make sure that we're all on time and do everything right. So thank you, Yutin Marcus. Thanks, Lima and Eleonora from the sec at the Secretariat who put in so many countless hours to making sure that we can operate as we do, of course. Um, and then lastly, thank you to the staff here um, at the Astral Center for, you know, especially dealing with us going over time and for being making this happen. And, as always, thank you very much to our captioner, who is, you know, a faceless person who um, makes it. And if you please could, captioner, please just um, write your name just so we know to thank you correctly, properly, not just a random person on the other side of the world. Thank you so Heidi much. Thank you Thomas, thank you so oh, much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heidi. So that's it. Thank you too, Tatiana. Uh, she's really done so much of the, of the work getting this together as well. And so 
with that, I'll hand it back to you. No, first, let me thank you as well, because you are the last but not least person to thank in this wrap up. Please give the panel a big round of applause and thank you. See you next year.